And what's nice about doing this talk, there's lots of very nice pictures on the internet of, <laughs> of children asleep. Um, so sleep enhances, and again, it's, it's re so I'm repeating things really to make the emphasis. It enhances the ability to learn, ability to memorise, for us to be able to make logical decision-making processes. It actually helps regulate our emotional well-being. Um, it actually has a role in, again, regulation of the immune system and restocking that, um, fine-tuning our body metabolism, regulating appetite, and there is evidence that if you have a short sleep cycle, then actually you're more prone to obesity, um, and et cetera, et cetera. And they're all interlinked. So you can't, as Meg said earlier, you can't separate physical health from mental health. They're all interconnected as part of the whole. And actually, if you don't have a good quality sleep, of, of sleep, it has really profound detrimental effects on your physical and mental well-being. Um, so not everyone does enough of it. When you don't do enough of it, it really does have a major impact. Um, and we know that sleep really promotes all the physical things of life as well as the uh, cognitive. So it really does help growth, learning, cognitive development. It has a role in immunity and heart health as well in the longer term. So there are certain sort of phrases that are used. One is sleep hygiene, and essentially that means your kind of your routine, your lead up and your routine around, well, we're talking about children and child's bedtime. So sort of the modifiable behavioural and environmental factors that affect what you do when you're preparing to go to sleep. And then sleep onset latency is the time taken to actually fall asleep. And these things change in childhood. So there are kind of, you know, that, that there is a process through child development. So for naught to two-year-olds, that time from going off to sleep is on average about 19 minutes. Toddlers to 12-year-olds average 17 minutes, but generally we ex expect children, I know it doesn't always happen, to fall asleep within about 30 minutes, and that's considered normal. And then the other thing to say is that your sleep duration, so how much sleep you need, um, actually changes during childhood. Um, and there are... And, and there are recommendations... Um, and evidence base for this. So this is consensus from the American Ac Ac the Academy, sorry, the American Ac Academy of Sleep Medicine um, had a consensus meeting, um, and you know, as expected, little babies need to sleep most of the night, um, and that averages 12 to 16 hours, including regular naps, through to teenagers. So the duration gets shorter, but as you can see, it's still a significant amount of time that we expect children to be asleep. And then teenagers, 8 to 10 hours, um, and us as adults, I'm sure you would say, probably 8 hours is the average um, of what we would expect to, to be a good night's sleep. And then, sorry, I'm just going to go back here. The other, the other thing to say in regard to naps, so... Um, so napping during the daytime, as you can see, is quite normal um, and usually disappears around three to seven years of age. Um, and there is a, naturally, in our human cycle, we're obviously awake and refreshed in the morning. Then we have a natural dip in the afternoon and hence um, the Mediterranean countries all have, have their, their siesta for good physiological reasons um, before there's again a, a refreshing period and then night time and sleep. And then children naturally wake up at night and again this is normal. Um, so newborns have to wake up, need to wake up because they need to feed um, to be able to settle again. So newborns wake to feed approximately two times per night. By six months this should have decreased to once per night. 20 to 30 percent, so nearly a third of children between toddler age still wake on a regular basis reduced to about 10% by five years of age, but actually, you know, sleep arousals, sleep, just brief sleep awakenings, again, is physiological and normal. And most children should be able to sort of settle themselves back to sleep by school age. 
So all of us have a sleep cycle and this is what we call a hypnogram which shows what happens in sleep and we have stages of sleep that we go through and cycle through um, and the main ones are non-REM sleep, so non-rapid eye movement sleep which is, a, is these phases here. So initially at the beginning of the night we go through these stages in non-rapid eye movement sleep to deep sleep down here and then we come up briefly into what's called rapid eye movement sleep uh, or dream sleep and, and we have brief periods of these throughout the night. Babies have much more REM sleep, so 50% of infants have, um, or 50% of infants have 50% of REM sleep during the night, and that's because actually we know that that's lighter sleep and they need to wake up to feed, so again it's physiological and, and normal. During the first half of the night you're in the deeper part of sleep, um, and so children we would generally expect to settle and keep settled, and then as the next part of the night happens during REM sleep, when it's generally a lighter sleep with more arousals, then you might expect children to wake up. But again, that can be normal. And then during non-REM sleep, so that tends to be when the brain waves are slower, we think it's important for storing and consolidating information that we've learnt. Um, it tends to be a more restorative phase, so, so the body can regenerate, re-energise, um, and there's a relaxation of your fight and flight responses, so your heart rate tends to slow down, your breathing rate slows down, your core body temperature becomes cooler, so that you're almost in a sort of hibernation state, if you like, so that you can actually regenerate and refresh yourself. And during, but during this stage of sleep, you, children may get night terrors and, they, and that's when you tend to do your sleepwalking. So although it's a kind of a deep sleep, your brain emotional centres might be more active. So this is when you might get sleepwalkers or night terrors. But night terrors you don't remember in the morning as opposed to nightmares where you do remember in the, or can remember in the morning. And then your rapid eye movement sleep is kind of when we dream. Brain becomes more active. You have rapid side to side movements of your eyes. Um, but paradoxically, your muscles actually become paralysed and relaxed, um, and that's thought to help us make new neural connections and again assimilating new and existing knowledge. So we're consolidating our learning and our our brain networks. So as, the, as I've said, the first half of the sleep tends to be deeper sleep, and then second half more light and more REM sleep. So uh, taking out of the equation OI at the moment, ab abnormal sleep is very common in children and sleep problems affect up to 25%. So that's a quarter of school aged children have sleep problems and most of those are kind of behavioural aspects of sleep, you know, not settling down in the wrong environment, too, too busy, too much going on, um, electronic gadgets which we'll come to. Um, and that's much higher in children with more neurodevelopmental disorders and obviously if you've all got on top of that chronic health issues then that's going to impact also on your sleep quality. And we know that poor sleep quality can be associated with hyperactivity because you can't focus, you can't attend to tasks, you're fidgety, um, more challenging behaviours, poor learning progress. You can be sleepy in the daytime because you haven't had enough sleep at night. can be associated with bedwetting, obesity we've mentioned, and interestingly accidental injury, and particularly in the teenage group, actually sort of causes of death in teenagers, the most common cause of death is accidental injury, and it's thought that sleep deprivation may be playing an important part in that role. So when we're asking about sleep, and I think, you know, I, I, what, we'll ask what your experience is about when you go to your clinics and see us as the medical staff, do we ask about sleep? And I suspect we don't always ask. So there are good screening tests just to kind of really, uh, this is the BEARS and it's just an acronym for asking about bedtime, falling asleep, staying asleep, excessive daytime sleepiness, whether there's lots of a waking up at night, 
regularity and duration of sleep, what time do you go to bed, what about weekends, how much sleep do you actually get, and then perhaps asking other family members whether children or adults are snoring, stopping breathing during the night, so that you can get a kind of a, a, an overall screening picture of what sleep is like. And then just to say the teenagers, because teenagers are different, and we often ascribe teenagers to sleeping all the time, always in bed, you know, not getting up on time, you know, always tired, but actually that is a physiological process, and that's because their whole biological clock is kind of maturing and developing, and actually their sleep onset time is programmed to be later, so they don't feel tired and they don't fall asleep until relatively later on, but they're having to get up for school at the same time, they're having to do the same things in the daytime, so actually, if we've said earlier on they need at least eight to ten hours of sleeping, then actually that sleep duration's got shorter, so they can't, you know, so they get chronically sleep deprived. So there's an intrinsic change into the brain systems that are still maturing about age, the circadian rhythm, which tells us when we're tired, when's night time, when's wake time, and also the other homeostasis, so the other physiological systems that are telling the brain and the body to sleep. And, we, and again, when you just look at teenagers and sleep, the percentage of sleep difficulties is pretty high, and this is in healthy school-age teenagers. This was done as a report in 2014 in 15-year-olds. Boys and girls can see sleep difficulties. A lot of them reported difficulties being able to concentrate and focus on work. And also there's a predictive longer term problem with adult sleep if you've already got sleep problems in adolescence. So again, just thinking about generic things. So as, uh, even though sleep problems, well, they are very common just generally. So a large part of those are due to really environmental factors or not getting that sleep routine, that sleep hygiene right. And things that are really common sense but actually probably need to be reinforced, again, in this world of electronic devices and connectivity. Um, so it's very important that... So physical exertion is really important, but not right before bedtime because that increases your heart rate, increases your body temperature and actually sleep makes you cool down and we want to cool down. Consistency, so the brain and the body absolutely like consistency, so going to bed at the same time, having the same amount of sleep, waking up at the same time is really important. No stimulating food or drinks, so for children, you know, highly charged energy drinks, fizzy drinks, Coca-Cola, not a good idea just before sleep. Generally winding down at least an hour before going to sleep. No screens, so no gadgets for at least an hour, an hour and a half before bedtime. And, you know, dimming the lights, it's got, to, it's got to feel like night time. So low lighting, dark, quiet room, own bed, a toy if that's helpful. And limiting fussing around, you know, one more story, Dad, one more drink, please, etc., etc. Trying to limit those things if possible. And then reducing the attention, going back and forth to calling out and going in and out just trying to kind of really sort of calm that down. Easier, easier said than done, I, I, I know. So those are kind of more general aspects. And then if we look at, the, uh, if we look at uh, sleep aspects in OI, as I said, not very much specifically known or written about specific to children in OI. There was a poster presented by the Sheffield Children's Hospital in an international conference in Salzburg in the summer. And what they did is sampled by questionnaire um, ch children and carers coming into their service as outpatients. 55 completed a questionnaire just to really look at sleep and the quality of sleep. It crossed all types of OI um, and age range, toddler age to teenager. And you can see actually there was, as one might expect, a high prevalence of sleep problems. Nearly 70% reporting difficulty getting to sleep waking up at night, but remember waking up at night may be normal, difficult to know from this study. Over half difficulties waking in the morning um, and quite a proportion reported snoring. 
and when this was broken down, so this side difficulty getting to sleep and waking in the night. So the, the, the features that really stood out for the OI population, so, so going off to sleep was really feeling too hot. And we know in OI your body temperature tends to be high, you tend to be warm, quite sweaty. Um, so that was a, a, a real issue in both going off to sleep and in staying asleep and also not able to get comfortable. There wasn't a clear differentiation between what not getting comfortably was compared with pain, but again, across both aspects, um, it was you know, there in high prevalence and, and pain and stiffness after that. And just talking to some of the kids in cool bones this morning, you know, they mentioned feeling too hot or, and also mentioned sort of worrying and, st and stressing and being anxious about various things. The other aspect is, you know, is there a primary sleep problem? Is, is sleep not good quality because something's happening with the actual sleep itself? So is there a primary sleep disorder? Again, there are very few studies in children with OI. There's a French study quite recently, um, and it, it looked back at the children coming through their service. This was done in Paris. Um, and they suspected by just looking at the charts which, which uh, children had symptoms, for example, snoring, um, not breathing properly at night time, irritable in the morning, sleepy in the morning. And of those, they then suspected that they might have a primary sleep problem. Um, and they did sleep studies, so proper medical analysis of what their sleep looked like. Um, and they did find what we call obstructive sleep apnea in 6.4%, which is significantly higher than what we usually see. So in the general pedi paediatric population, probably about 1% to 4% may have obstructive sleep apnea. And that means something's obstructing your airway, kind of, so you, it causes you to snore. Most commonly, that's big adenoids, big tonsils, which you might need to just remove. But in OI, it, it may be because of just your body shape, um, your smallness, your body shape in terms of bone structure, chest structure. Um, but they did find it was more frequent in those that were non-ambulant or assisted walkers. There was no difference across, they looked at a more severe OI population, but no difference otherwise across OI type. Um, and of those that they found who did have obstructive sleep apnea, then a small proportion of those needed some breathing support at night time to actually relieve symptoms. And, some, uh, and a few of those also just had their adenoids and tonsils removed, which may be enough. And then if we look at fatigue in OI, fatigue we acknowledge and recognise as very common for all kinds of different reasons. Um, and you know, all of these, and again, I think fatigue and sleep are very closely related. Um, and we can have physical as well as psychological or mental aspects. And I think, again, you can't really separate the two. So because joints are a little bit more stretchy and loose jointed, then actually the effort in walking and doing physical stuff is tiring in itself and causes fatigue, fracture, surgery. All of those things are going to impact on your physical well-being. Muscles can be weak. You may have medication both for pain which may be having an effect on how you feel. Um, and also the fear and anxiety of surgery, of recovery from fracture, that's going to impact on mood and how you feel generally. Um, and if you've just had a fracture, you can't access school as well, then there's some sense of social isolation. isolation. Activity levels, whether it's too much or too little, may cause excess fatigue. Nutritional status, vitamin status, if you're short of vitamin D, that might make you a little bit more tired. So again, very important to kind of think about. And then, of course, pain and how that interacts with all of those things. Am I doing this time? Um, and then pain, I really just uh, two slides to mention, because again, we've talked about pain this morning. Meg talked about pain a little bit in her psychology session. But it must never be underestimated about what that has as an effect. We looked at pain now. It was a long time ago when I looked at it. There's a, we, we published something, a systematic analysis of children coming through our service right back in 2005. And actually, from 2005 
from a clinical research fellow that was funded by the Brittle Bone Society. And actually, it was probably the first systematic review of actually pain in, a, in OI in children. We did various measures of pain, um, and uh, we randomly selected children coming through to the service. And again, both, we looked at both fracture pain and non-fracture pain. So in between times of fracture, there was a high prevalence of pain. And how this affected your activities of daily living. And you can see that um, getting off to sleep, and I suppose not surprisingly with a recent fracture, getting off to sleep and staying asleep was very highly related to sleeping difficulties. Um, and still quite high in those that just, just had in-between types of um, musculoskeletal pain um, and here at the bottom and I hope this has changed I mean this was 2005 but actually the use of painkillers and medication particularly in the in the fracture group was very underutilized um, and at that stage when we did the study there were children that had not been offered painkillers when they first fractured so although some of this may have changed I think we can you know you can see the impact that having pain has both at times of fracture and at times of non-fracture. So strategies to help sleep and reduce fatigue levels can be from the medical aspect, recognition of pain, asking about it, understanding where it's coming from and managing it. Bisphosphonates has a subjective role in helping pain, but not every pain. Um, and that's why we need to understand what the pain is. It's important to ask about other causes of fatigue, the sleep apnea, which I've talked about, anemia, vitamin deficiencies, from the medical side, really important to ask. And sometimes you do need some medication. If it's, a, if it's a, something to do with behavioural sleep, difficulty getting off to sleep, occasionally things like melatonin can help, but it, that's not going to help your pain if it's pain that needs to be managed. And then more practical management, again, we know that OI individuals are hotter, get hot, get sweaty, trying to cool the body temperature down at night time, thinking of practical measures, and of course thinking about equipment, your um, seating, positioning, bedding, all extremely important. And then during the daytime, practical strategies to, to hopefully manage fatigue. Um, and again, it's about, some of it's about, again, commonsensical things, thinking about conserving your energy, avoiding that boom and bust effect, you know, going for hell and leather and then flopping down completely exhausted, regular rest periods, graded activity and strengthening, don't stop all activity and you know working with the school to liaise about adaptive PE, other adaptations, lifts and rather than stairs, wheelchair for longer school trips, etc. Supportive equipment, thinking about seating, handwriting, supporting um, equipment in school and addressing mood anxiety levels and recognizing them and dealing with them concurrent with all these other things. So um, key take home mes messages, I'm already <laughs> over I think time for, for Jude. So good quality sleep vital for optimal physical and mental well-being. Foundation of good quality sleep is the development of good sleep habits and routines. Behavioural difficulties are common, regardless of whether you have OI or not. Um, fatigue in the OI, I think we do well recognise that, and it's multifactorial, but I think sleep problems specific to our OI are probably under-recognised and under-evaluated. Okay, next. I'm going to pass it to you. Oh, I've got your watch, Catherine. It's nice. I'll make sure I don't steal that from you. Looks, like, yeah, very nice. Um, cool. So I, I think I, I sort of thought about this uh, talk in a similar approach to Megan, who was talking to us earlier about um, mental health, in that I wanted to think about some practical things we can do. So I'm not going to show you the data that shows that adults with OI can have problems with sleep and fatigue, because... I don't need to tell you that, um, because lots of you know that. Um, so what I really want to do, and I'm going to try and do it in about 15 minutes, is to share some strategies that might help you. Some of these are um, it's some practical ideas that you could try at home and see if that, if that helps with sleep, and that applies for any of us, because we can all have problems with, with our sleep. So, where am I going? Um, 
I just need to acknowledge one of my registrars, uh, Dr. Alex Lowe. He has an interest in sleep, and fortunately, just before I was asked to uh, give this talk, he wrote these slides for uh, a talk for us. He spoke to us as doctors about sleep um, in one of our education things, and then he spoke at our a patient day at Stanmore. So if anybody saw that, you can go to sleep because you've probably heard it before, but I think it's worth hearing some of this stuff again. So I was going to get you all to talk to each other and then feed back, but in my experience that takes time and I haven't got very much time. So um, I might just skip our discussion and uh, just move on to some of the strategies because I really don't want to miss them. So what is insomnia? Okay, so insomnia is difficulty falling asleep or maintaining sleep and it can lead to impairment in the daytime. This is the official definition. Um, and it's called insomnia if you have it for more than three months and it's at least three days a week. So it's not allowed to be explained by anything else. So it's not insomnia when your neighbours have a party and you can't get to sleep. Um, but it is an issue and it's estimated that just less than 6% of the whole population have problems with sleep. So if we've all, you know, if 6% of us have problems with sleep and that's more common in people with OI. So there's a model as to how this develops, and this is my only sciencey bit. Um, so you can imagine that we're all predisposed to problems with sleep, and so before you have a problem, your yellow predisposition is there. And that's the same across all these ideas. So preclinical is like before you have a problem, acute would be when it's just happened, and then early it's going on a bit longer, and chronic is when it's gone on for more than three months. So for you to be acutely having problems with your sleep, often there's a precipitating factor. So something comes along and that's the big problem. And that causes a problem with the sleep. That might be something in life, you know, you're doing exams or you're worried or something's going on at work or um, you're ill or something like that. Then in the sort of earlier phase, you've got less of that precipitating problem, but then there's, there's things that perpetuate the problem with sleep. And sometimes that's behaviours and things that you've, you've done or um, habits that have formed or maybe you're getting used to going to bed later and later and you just keep going to bed later and later. But then when things become chronic, the precipitating cause might have gone away, um, but those, uh, those strategies and things that you've done are actually perpetuating the problem. Now this isn't always a problem and you'll move between, you could potentially move between these phases because you might have a new precipitating problem. Does that make sense? Yeah? You're not all asleep? Not yet? Okay, good. So who's um, have ever had a medic or someone talk to them about sleep hygiene? Is that something people are... Yeah, I can see one of my patients with their hands up there. <laughs> um, are people aware of the concept of sleep hygiene? I know Catherine mentioned it before. So sleep hygiene is really useful, but I don't think it's going to solve every sleep problem that we've got at all. This is actually something I print out and give to, give to patients about sleep. But just to highlight some of the most useful ideas. So, um, thinking more for adults, the bed is going to be for sleep and sex. So the bed isn't going to be for watching telly and maybe even for reading. The bed is for sleeping. Okay? Um, the bedroom's going to be cool, dark and safe. You don't want a clock if you can avoid it. Now, I'll admit I have a clock in my bedroom. Um, Smoking and alcohol, not within two hours of going to bed. Uh, increasing exercise that Dr. Deville's already mentioned. And only, potentially only going to bed when you feel tired and sleepy may help with sleep. So those are useful things. And I think when... So I'm a parent as well. And I'm really... Uh, when my kids were little, I was really fastidious about the bedtime routine. So yeah, CBeebies went off and... Um, you know, you run the bath, and they have the bath, and then you read the story, and you tuck them in, and you say good night, and you make sure it's dimly lit. I think as adults, we're pretty rubbish at doing that. I will put my hand up to that. You know, we're still on our phones, we're watching the telly, we're trying to do the dishes while we're hanging out the washing, and, you know, we, we're not as good at having that wind down, but we need it in the same way that kids need it to help us sleep. So that's just a, so sleep hygiene can help us. But one of the things that happens, and I think I, there was some 
some flavour of this from the people who were talking about pain and sleep before as well. But one of the things that often happens is um, when you're going about your normal day, you're busy and you're doing lots of things. You've got lots of stimulus, lots of things going on. You go to bed, you turn the light out and your mind is suddenly really active. Oh, I've got to do this. Oh, I've forgotten to do that. Oh, um, what will happen if that happens? And it can become a really, you know, that can become quite a vicious circle. So your mind becomes very active. And for people with OI, then you've got, and other conditions, you've got the addition of pain in there as well. So what could we do to help us when we're lying in bed and we're watching the clock and we're thinking, oh, I really, I've got to get up in five hours and I haven't gone to sleep. Um, and I just want to share some strategies. There are some guidelines for insomnia. If you really want to read them, they might send you to sleep. Um, but uh, here are some of the strategies. So the first one is this concept of a buffer zone. And I'm just going to bring this up. Sorry. So we know that when we're not tired, we function better in terms of cognition and thinking and decision making and problem solving. So the idea here is that rather than going to bed and lying in bed thinking about the problems that you've got or the things that are going on the next day, that earlier on in the day, maybe in early evening, um, you know, whenever would suit you, you have an allocated time, if you're one of these people who goes to bed and thinks about everything, you have an allocated time where you are going to think through what's happened that day, what needs to happen the next day, and kind of deal with it when you're not so tired and when your brain is functioning a bit better. And then if you've done that, when you go to bed, you've done your worrying and your thinking and you've got a strategy for thinking about those things. So what you can use for this, and this is just a, an example, is you can use a daily log. So you could write down the things that went badly or the things that are troubling you or the things that are issues and write them down. And then you can write down the positive things, the things that have gone well, the things that you have enjoyed that day, the things that you're looking forward to the next day. And then you write your kind of jobs to do. Now, I'm a big fan of the to-do list, so and I write them all very regularly. But I am a big fan of writing to-do lists, and mine are always too long. So I always write everything I think I could ever do. Um, so there's a strategy here. So you're going to write down your jobs, things you need to do, and you're going to categorise them. Are they essential? Are they desirable? Or are they optional? And the essential ones are the ones you know you've got to get done. You know, get the kids to school, go to work. You know, you might not write those things down every day. Um, desirable things you'd like to do and optional are kind of, well, it'd be nice if that happened, but, you know, it doesn't really matter. And by logging this down, it helps you later on to not be worrying about those things. So that's one strategy you might like to use. Um, the next one I want to go through is something called a thought algorithm. Um, I, it makes more sense if we just go through it. So let's imagine you're lying in bed, you've done all your sleep hygiene, it's lovely, it's cool, um, and a thought comes into your mind. And you've got to deal with that thought. And sometimes just thinking, oh, I don't want to think about that, doesn't help. So what could we do? Well, first thing, is it a useful thought? If it's not useful, then you can just say, yourself, that's not a useful thing to think about, and kind of bin it. So say, that's not useful. But maybe it is useful. Maybe you've forgotten to do something, or maybe you're thinking about something you mustn't forget tomorrow. So the first thing to think is, okay, it's useful. Can I do something about it now? If you can't do something about it now, then you're going to log it. So you might write that down, you might... I, I dread to say you might put it in your phone, but some, you might set an alarm on your phone that says tomorrow at nine, I've got to remember to do this. So you kind of park it, write it down, and uh, then you can stop worrying about it. If it is something you could do something about now, then you say, okay, I could do something about now, but could I do a better job of it tomorrow? Okay? And... If you could do a better job, you're going to log it. And if you're not, if you could, if there's not going to make any difference, you might as well do it and then go back to bed. So I'm going to give you a couple of fictitious ideas. So you're lying in bed, you think, oh dear, Boris Johnson's hair is a right mess. 
um, I can't, you know, or I can't stand in what, can you do anything? Is that useful? No. <laughs> so we've been Boris Johnson. Okay. Um, <laughs> I had Donald Trump written down as well, dear me. Um, okay, let's have another one. You're lying in bed, you think, did I lock the front door? Okay. Is that useful? Yes. Okay. Is it something you can do something about now? Yes. Uh, could you do a better job tomorrow? No. So you're going to do something about it now. I'll give you one last example here just to play it out. So you lie in bed, you think, I haven't bought the frozen peas for my dinner tomorrow. My son only likes frozen peas. He will have no vegetables if I don't buy the frozen peas. So useful? Yes. Can you do something about it now? Well, you could, because Tesco's is often open 24 hours, so you could get out of bed and go, but could you do a better job tomorrow? Well, pretty much. You don't really want to get dressed. and or People are seen in Tesco's in their pyjamas these days, but, you know, you, you would log that. So that might, be an, uh, that might be a helpful thing for you. There are some other strategies. Uh, just opening your eyes just changes the stimulus. Um, and I'm not going to go into these in the, in the uh, interest of time, but there's a concept called thought stopping, and there's another one which is a bit more wacky, which is called stepping out of the thought. Um, but if you wanted to look those things up, there's plenty online about them. So, so far we've talked about the strategies of having a buffer zone and a log to help you think things through at a time that you're not tired. Uh, the thought algorithm to kind of work things out. But the last thing I wanted to think of as a strategy is something called progressive muscle relaxation. I don't know if anybody's had a go at this or heard of this or ever... No? No. Yes? Yes. Excellent. So you were all really engaged earlier with the mindfulness activity and I'm hoping you're feeling as able to be engaged with something now because this is a little exercise that we could do together. Um, and it kind of does what it says on the tin, so basically it involves you um, tensing up a muscle group and then relaxing it, okay? And I'm going to talk you through it, um, and if you, if you don't mind, it's probably better done with your eyes shut. And you did so, we, did, we all did so well with this earlier, so this type of thing. So I'm hoping for everyone being engaged, and if the person next to you falls asleep, that's fine but I don't think you're going to. So is that okay? People happy? Good. Okay. So if you'd like to close your eyes and get comfortable and throughout the exercise we're going to keep our eyes closed and if you're able uh, preferably have your arms and legs uncrossed. So just as you're sat there, we're just going to just focus on our breathing. This isn't hypnosis. You're not going to lose consciousness. You're not going to lose control at any time. And I'm just going to ask you to tense different muscles of your body. And when I do, I want you to focus all of your attention on those muscles until I say relax. If that's painful or uncomfortable for you, then just stop tensing and just try and concentrate on your breathing. And as soon as I say relax, I want you to release the tension from that group of muscles straight away. Let it go. We're going to begin with your eyes. So when I say now, I want you to tense the muscles around your eyes as much as you can. Screw your eyes up as tight as you can and try and close your eyes tightly. Now. Keep those muscles tight. Feel the strain. Feel the tension. And relax. Relax immediately and completely. Smooth out those muscles. Let the tension slip away. Let the muscles go loose.
this time when I say now, tense the muscles in your shoulders. Lift your shoulders up and squeeze them together. And do that as hard as you can. Now, lift those shoulders, pull the muscles together and feel the tension. And relax. Take a moment to compare the tension you felt a minute ago and the relaxation that is emerging now around your shoulder muscles. Let the tension slip away. Let those muscles relax. <clears throat> this time, when I say now, tense the muscles in your hands. Make a tight fist and squeeze your hands as tightly as you can. Now. Feel that tension, feel that tightness. Squeeze the fingers together as much as you can. And relax. Relax those fingers completely, immediately. Let the muscles go. Let the tension slip away. And now we're going to move down to the thighs. And when I say now, tense the muscles in your thighs, squeeze them tightly together so that you feel that tension. Now. And relax. Take a moment again, compare the tension you felt a moment ago and the relaxation that comes. Let the comfortable feeling in your thighs grow deeper as you let the tension slip away. This time when I say now, Tense the muscles in your feet. Pull your toes tight up together and squeeze the muscles of your feet. Now, feel that tension, the toes curled up and the feet as tight as possible. And relax. Let those feet relax immediately and completely. Let the comfortable feeling in your feet grow deeper. And just remember the difference between the tension you felt and the relaxation in your feet now. We're coming to the end of the exercise. We'll just take a moment more to enjoy the feeling of relaxation that we now have in our eyes, shoulders, hands, thighs and feet. And if you'd like to, you can open your eyes. So that's a very short version of progressive muscle relaxation. Um, you, can, you can do it through many more muscle groups. So you can do um, forehead, middle of your face, shoulders, chest, abdomen, all the way, all the way down. And there's, there's resources online um, on YouTube and stuff that, could, that you could use to, to do that. Um, so I hope that was... Maybe, maybe not what you thought you were going to do in, in, in a sleep session. Um, but just to summarise, we've 
thought a little bit about insomnia and why it might happen. We know that you uh, and people with OI have more precipitating factors maybe than the general population. Um, I hope some of us might go home and think about our bedrooms and uh, a bit about sleep hygiene. And I've introduced you to a couple of little techniques that you might be able to use when sleep is a problem. So there's lots of other resources. Um, but I'll leave it there. So thank you.